I'll be. Morning, everybody. Please do sit down. Let me ask you to reach for a Bible uh, on the uh, ones you are given as you came in. We're looking at page 1022, 1022. That should be 1 John chapter 3. And this morning we're looking at uh, verses 11 to 24 as we continue our journey through this great letter. Let me lead us in prayer. We praise you, almighty God, for your presence with us and your promise to speak to us through your word and by your spirit, to do your work in us, to open our eyes and our hearts, to help us to know you, to love you, and to live in the way that honors you. We pray that you would do that work among us. In Jesus' name and for his sake, we pray. Amen. Let me start reading then from 1 John chapter 3 and verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. I hope you want to keep that open in front of you. There's also an outline in the talk on the back of the notice sheet that you were given when you came in. So here's the question I want us to start with, if we may. How do you cure a wobbly heart? How do you cure a wobbly heart? It's not a question for the medics, but for all of us. What do you do when you you have a heart wobble in the sense that you start worrying about whether or not you're a proper Christian? Uh, Let me mention three people. Names all changed as we begin. John has wobbles because he's so concerned about the presence of ongoing sin in his life. He thinks to himself regularly, surely if I really loved Jesus... I wouldn't keep on doing X. Uh, Sarah is different. Her wobbles are because one of her best friends actually has just left the church and started going to a church with a completely different theology. Another of her friends says that uh, they've lost their faith completely. And so she's asking, well, how do I know that I believe the right things and that I'm in the right place? And last but not least is Jamie. Uh, He's been living for Christ for a few years. He's been facing recently more and more opposition for the things that he believes. And the interesting thing is where the opposition is coming from, because it's not in his case from unbelievers, people outside of the church. It's from people who still claim to be Christians and who talk about love, but who keep on attacking him for believing what the Bible teaches about truth, about salvation, about heaven and hell, and about sex and gender. And it is making his heart wobble. So what do you do? How do you heal a case 
of the wobbles. We're told all the time, aren't we, to listen to our hearts? But we're discovering this morning that there are times when we need to do exactly the opposite. There are times when we need to, to take our heart to one side and to give it a good talking to. We need to reassure our heart with the truth of God's word. Let me read verse 19 again. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before God. Uh, That's the big aim of the whole passage in lots of ways of the whole of 1 John. It's here to reassure the heart of anyone who believes in Jesus, who loves his people, that we have passed from death to life and that God abides in us and that we abide in him. Um, To to get us to that point, John does a a rerun of last week's passage, but from a slightly different angle. So last week, if you were here, we met two families. There's God's family and the devil's, as John puts it. And John said, you can tell who's in whose family by looking at our attitude to sin and righteousness. If I'm uh, casual about obeying God, if I habitually disregard what he has to say, and live a life of sin without repenting and turning back to him. That wouldn't be a good sign at all. If I'm committed in my life to living in the way that pleases God and reflects his character, that would be a sign, even if I don't do it perfectly, of whose family I'm in. Now, this morning, John's going to rerun the same argument, but he's going to do it uh, about love instead. Uh, Here's a a brilliant pithy summary of the the passage from one of the commentaries by John Stott. He says, hatred characterizes the world whose prototype is Cain. It originates in the devil, issues in murder, and is evidence of spiritual death. But love characterizes the church whose prototype is Christ. It originates in God issues in self-sacrifice, and is evidence of eternal life. I tried to make the same point in the table on the sheet. We're going to think about the two families, as you can see, uh, in turn. And our first major heading then, the world will hate you. Don't be surprised. Let me read from verse 11. This is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We shouldn't be like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. So number one quality of the true church is love. Uh, It's the message that John's readers have been hearing ever since the beginning of their Christian life. We love God. With all of our heart, we love our neighbor as ourselves. So in a church community, we're not out for each other's blood. We don't push ourselves forward at each other's expense. We don't gossip behind one another's back or use our words to belittle one another or to tear one another down. We are for each other and we build each other up because we're to be a family that is built on love. But if you've ever read Genesis 4, you'll know that Cain wasn't like that. He didn't love his brother. He hated him to the point of committing the first ever murder. Here's the story of how it happened. So the two brothers offered uh, a sacrifice to the Lord, each their own. And God was pleased with Abel's offering because it was offered, and the letter to the Hebrews tells us, by faith. It was offered in believing obedience and trust in God. Cain's offering was devoid of faith. And so God had no regard for it. And in response, Cain was furious. So God spoke to him and gave him another opportunity to respond in faith, but Cain was unmoved. uh, And he allowed a, a fierce jealousy of his brother to take hold of his heart. And it festered in him. And it grew into a bitter hatred until one day Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. God asked, where is your brother Abel? And Cain lied famously, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the answer, of course, is yes. That's exactly what you were meant to be. You were meant to be a family who look out for one another. 
But as John says in verse 12 of our passage, Cain's behavior demonstrated that he wasn't a part of God's family at all. He belonged to the other family, the one that Jesus had said was a murderer from the beginning. But just look down at verse 12 with me to see John's insight into the motive that drove Cain forward. Why did he murder Abel? John says, because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. This is a phenomenally important. John's saying this is the, the reason that it is normal for the world to hate the believing church. And it is because righteousness naturally breeds deep resentment in the hearts of others. It's how Jesus himself puts it. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light lest their works should be exposed. In the Gospels, it's why the Jewish authorities ended up demanding the death of Jesus. They hated the way that his light exposed their own darkness. So they did a cane and they killed Jesus. And here's the point, as it was with Jesus, so it will be with his church. Jesus again, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. And John's making much the same points here. Christian believers abide in the light. We live righteous lives. So don't be surprised if and when the world hates us. It's not the the language that the world uses, of course. No one ever says, we hate you because your deeds are righteous. They say, we hate you because you're so narrow and bigoted and dangerous, and your views are out of step with the modern world. But God says, don't be fooled. Beneath the words, whether they're aware of it or not, there's a a deeper hatred of the light that is going on. Uh, And once again, it's putting our heads back into the situation of John's readers that helps us to understand why he is saying this. Uh, One of the big things that he's doing all the way through the letter, we've seen this, isn't it, is to remove the mask from the people we've called the leavers, this group of people who had left the church and left the apostles' teaching behind. Uh, Now, I have no idea if Scooby-Doo is still a thing. Do children still watch? I'm looking for a parent. Do children still watch Scooby-Doo? Some do, apparently. I used to love Scooby-Doo, both as a child and then as a parent. I I do an incredible impression of Scooby-Doo, and I'm not going to share it with you this morning. But there's a there is a moment, or ever for that matter. But there's a there's a moment at the at the end of every episode when the the baddie you'll know this if you've ever seen it, who's been terrorizing everyone, is unmasked, and we see it's not actually a flesh-eating zombie. It's Mr. Jackson from the hardware store on the corner, and John deliberately here in this letter is unmasking the levers. They might sound really spiritual. They might talk about knowing God. They might say that they love people. John saying, here's the mask taken away. This is the reality. Verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever doesn't love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Or on to verse 17, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So again, the diagnostic, the way that the leavers were behaving tells the truth. They talk about love but it's just talk. I don't think they were literally going around murdering people in the church family, although martyrdom was a real danger for people like John in the first century, but they were closing their heart to their brothers and sisters in the church. They were refusing to share what they had with those who needed their help. They were pulling people away from the truth of the apostles, and thereby they were showing whose family they belonged to. 
And it is a pretty damning unmasking. Someone can claim to know God. They can claim to have moved on in a positive way from the truth of the apostles. They can claim to love people. They can leave behind the message of Christ and him crucified. And their claims can make your hearts wobble. But John says, let the truth reassure your hearts. Believers aren't alive. They're dead. They're not in God's family. They're in the other one. They're no different to Cain. So don't be surprised when they act like it. That's the big imperative here again in verse 13, isn't it? Don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. The telling thing is that the focus isn't on the unbelieving world in general, but the leavers who speak from the world, this is chapter 4, verse 5, and who speak with the world's approval. And this caution is really important for us. Uh, if you come regularly to church, you'll know that you will find it in the New Testament from Jesus himself, uh, as well as from Peter and from Paul and from Luke and from John. And we're told again and again, don't be surprised when the world hates you because, as a rule, we are surprised. And we're even more surprised when the bit of the world that hates us is dressed up in religious, I know God and love people more than you do clothes. Here in the UK, I think we're just coming to the end of some very unusual times. Uh, for centuries, Christianity has been mainstream. It's been perfectly possible to proclaim the word of life that we received from the apostles and to do it freely and without much fear of being hated. And for us, that feels normal. We're in the land of the book after all. But when you look across history and you look around the world, friends, that is not normal at all. The normal state of affairs is for the world and for the worldly church to hate the believing church. We tend to think that if only we're really rational and gracious in the uh, preaching of the truth, then everyone will love us. But God says, no, if you're part of God's true family, if you're righteous, if you stand for the things of righteousness, then you should expect to be hated just as Cain hated Abel and for the same reason. Because the world and the worldly church wants the freedom to ignore God without having their deeds of darkness exposed by the light. That is normal. So we shouldn't be surprised that the, the Scottish and Westminster governments are planning legislation that will make it impossible or illegal, I should say, for parents and teachers and ministers and medical professionals to say things that Christians have been saying, uh, and many others have believed for 2,000 years. And we shouldn't be surprised when the worldly church starts attacking the believing church and trolling it online and being spiteful and vengeful and deliberately misquoting us and so on and so on. That is the normal state of affairs, and it is coming more and more to Scotland. Uh, I won't go into any details, but over the last few years, I've seen a few instances of really faithful, godly ministers being subjected to hateful, jealous, and deliberately deceitful attacks. And they came actually not from the worldly press, but from church leaders, some of whom I used to respect. Attacks that came ironically in the name of love. And it is enough to make your heart wobble but John says, don't let it. The world will hate you. Don't be surprised. It's enough of that, isn't it? Let's move on to the positive under our second major heading. The church will love, be reassured. And after all of that, I suspect we need this encouragement. This, though, is the, the message that we've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Uh, I was working on this around the time of Valentine's Day, and you don't need to, me to tell you that our society is obsessed with love. We have love stories, love songs, love letters, love actually. I know some of you are fans. We even have a love island. But despite the obsession, we're not brilliant at explaining what love is. 
uh, the dictionary I consulted offers three definitions. A profound, tender affection for someone. A, warm, a feeling of warm personal attachment or sexual uh, uh, passion and desire. Uh, that's what love is. I asked ChatGPT. Um, it did a bit better, but it, it still said that love is an emotion that it's a feeling of affection and attachment. It is no wonder, is it, that our society is so confused about relationships. But thankfully, we're not left in any doubt about the kind of love that marks out God's family. Verse 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So the heart of love is sacrifice. Uh, it's not an emotion. It's not a feeling of sexual desire. It's not just words or talk, but many acts of sacrifice that are patterned after the greatest act of sacrifice in history. Scott quoted Jesus, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In that context, Jesus is contrasting the behavior of hired hands and the good shepherd. Hired hand cares nothing for the sheep, so a wolf comes, he runs away, and leaves the sheep unprotected. You can imagine him saying, I'm not my brother's keeper. But the good shepherd cares more about the sheep's welfare than his own, and so he lays down his life for them. And that act of sacrifice pretty much defines Christianity. If you're here as a guest this morning, it's what we'd love you to understand and to take hold of. Um, we sort of understand the idea, I think, in a program I was watching the other day, a father chose to allow himself to be killed uh, and he died to protect the life of his son. Uh, in another, a guy gave his life for a woman that he loved. So we sort of get the idea of sacrifice. Normally, though, for, the, for someone uh, with whom you are already in a relationship, with Jesus, it's on another level. Because it was while we were still his enemies that he chose to lay down his life for us. Just think of that, that I chose to sin against Jesus. And he responded by choosing to die for me. He freely chose to go through hell so that I could go to heaven. I'd love to talk with you about that more afterwards if you're just checking things out uh, for the first time today. But here it's that act of sacrifice that sets the template for the character of the church family. It's impossible to receive that love from Jesus and then refuse to pass it on to others, to say the same thing in different words. When the, when the love of Jesus captures your heart, you cannot then close your heart to his people because in him, they have become your brothers and sisters. And so you will love them, not just in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. They are challenging words. And we're going to hear more of that challenge over the next couple of weeks. But for today, I want us to allow the encouragement to reassure our hearts, because that's what John's doing here. Verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love, like the leavers, abides in death. Or on to verse 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. So how do you go about healing a wobbly heart? Well, part of the answer is to ask yourself which family you're in. Are you in family hate with Cain and the devil? Or are you in family love with Jesus? Are you out for the, the blood of the apostles and for people who teach and live like them? Or are you willing to lay down your life 
in service of the people around you. It's not an exclusive test. There are other vital signs of true faith that we've met already in the letter and we'll meet again that aren't in view this morning. Not exclusive test and not a crippling test either. I hope we've said enough. I think it's been literally every week so far in this series that John doesn't expect us to be living out our true and new identity in Christ perfectly. He said right up front in the letter, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So it's not about perfection, but it is about who's your family. What does your life say about which of these two families you belong to? The closed heart, jealous, hating, out for the blood of the righteous, like Cain family, or the open-hearted, love and lay down your life for the sake of others, and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, family. And John is saying to his readers, I know you guys, you're not perfect. But you're not the ones who have left the apostles' teaching behind. You're not the ones who are downplaying the need for Jesus' death on the cross. You're in the family that abides in the word, that believes in Jesus, and that wants to grow in love. So take your wobbly heart to one side and reassure it. You have passed over from death to life. You are of the truth. You can know that you are in God's family. Verse 20 is realistic, isn't it? It's not always going to feel that you're in God's family. There will be times when your heart condemns you. Uh, It might be that the evil one uh, says things that aren't true. You're not a proper Christian because you just mucked up. Or maybe like Sarah and Jamie I mentioned at the start, you're unsettled by people who have left the faith or who hate what you stand for. Maybe like John at the start, you're rightly convicted because you're there have been a, as, there's been a time when you haven't loved other people as much as you should have done. But God is greater than your heart. And he knows all things. So don't listen to your wobbly heart. Speak the truth to your heart instead. Reassure it. Because, as verse 21 says, we have real confidence before God. So the opposite of a wobbly heart is a confident heart. And as ever in the Bible, that confidence will express itself in prayer. Verse 22, whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Uh, We'll come back to prayer in chapter five. And John will make it clear it's not a blank check. I'm, I'm sorry if this disappoints you. There is no promise here that if you ask God nicely, you'll wake up tomorrow morning with superpowers. That would be fun. I've always wanted to be able to teleport uh, from A to B. That is not on offer here. What is guaranteed is that whenever you ask anything according to his will, that's the language of chapter five, then your father in heaven will hear and will give it to us. That promise is way better than an invisibility cloak. If we are Christians, we can be 100% confident that we are doing God's will. His commandment is that we believe in Jesus. His commandment is that we love one another. We're not going to do either of them perfectly, but we're a part of God's true family. We know the God of all as our Father. We know that we've passed from death to life. We know we're of the truth. We know that we abide in God and he abides in us. And that gives us this enormous privilege that we can approach God at any time in prayer. We can know that he hears us. We can know that we always receive what we ask for because our heart's desire is for his will to be done. Well, I'm done. Our hearts wobble for lots of reasons. Big part of the cure here to remember which family you're in. We're not of the world if we're trusting in Jesus. We're God's children because we believe in Jesus and we're committed to loving one another. And because we know that that's God's will, we can ask him to help us to do that more and more. And we can know that he's going to hear that prayer and answer it. So why don't I lead us as we pray now.
Almighty God, we want to thank you again for the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you that he was willing to lay down his life for us. Thank you that we're going to celebrate that in a few moments as we share the Lord's Supper together. We would pray that you would so capture our hearts with the love of the Lord Jesus, that we don't close our heart to you, to your truth or to your people, but that we open our hearts and that we're willing to lay down our lives for one another. We pray that you would steady us and reassure us and comfort us when the world hates us, and especially when it's the worldly church that does so. Help us not to wobble, but to abide in the truth, to keep believing in Jesus and keep loving his people. And thanks for this great reassurance that we are yours, that we have passed over from death to life, that we abide in you and you in us, and that you love to hear our prayers. We pray, therefore, for reassured hearts, particularly for any here this morning who are going through a wobble. And we pray for greater and greater love among us, knowing that by this will all people know that we are your disciples if we have love one for another. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.